Hello, I'm Michael Ruhl, an in vivo imaging specialist with Spectral Instruments Imaging. Welcome to Preclinical Imaging, a research service for core and animal facilities. Let's chat a little bit about what preclinical optical imaging is. It is a small research model, models like mice, rats, plants, fish, axolotls, to name a few, imaging modality that offers non-invasive, relatively quick data collection without intensive user training, while remaining largely true to the three R's. With optical imaging, researchers can monitor fundamental biological processes taking place in living organisms. How? Optical imaging systems provide a view, or window, if you will, into an organism of cellular and molecular level events via bioluminescent or fluorescent light emission, making the visualization, acquisition, and analysis of molecular level biological activity in the same study cohort achievable in real time and repeatable over weeks or months. One might ask, why use preclinical optical imaging instead of standard histological processes or microscopy? There are a variety of advantages with optical imaging. One can see and capture real-time processes longitudinally with optical imaging. The modality, along with other preclinical modalities such as ultrasound, micro CT, PET, SPECT, and MRI, offer the ability to view and explore the mechanisms of disease and other biological conditions while overcoming the limitations of histological time point based analysis. Instead of dealing with the variability of comparing different individuals, that is the same strain with different mice, for example, of that strain, and their data collected at different time points, one can use the same cohort repeatedly. Instead of large numbers of individuals needed at various time points, longitudinal data is collected with the same ones, greatly reducing the number needed over the course of the study. Data collection is far less labor intensive than histology and microscopy. You simply follow the same organism over time. An optical allows the detection of the beginnings of disease prior to evident symptoms or behavioral changes, such as being able to detect a tumor before it can be palpated. Let's quickly compare traditional versus in vivo methodology in terms of data collection. For histology and microscopy, several animals are sacrificed at various time or treatment points. In this example, we see the method uses four groups of six mice over eight hours for 24 mice total. By contrast, optical imaging uses one group of six over the complete eight hour time course. So same models are used over time, which results in a smaller inner cohort number and better paired data. What does this mean from a facility space perspective? Broadly, that researchers may need fewer mice per experiment, which might open up a facility's ability to house a greater variety of experimental models per researcher. Alternatively, a facility might be able to offer space to a greater number of individual researchers, and both are advantageous. So we've established what preclinical optical imaging is and how it varies from standard histological or time point harvested data. We can see the preclinical is a state-of-the-art imaging modality, it's not fringe tech, and that it is quite essential for many preclinical research investigations. Consequently, having optical capability is a worthwhile investment. Let's talk about the utility of preclinical optical imaging in the academic and biotech environment, and how animal and core facilities are uniquely qualified to manage such systems and services. This technology is essential to many researchers performing preclinical research, and both academia and industry can benefit from its use. Having preclinical optical imaging on site is also useful as a recruitment tool to bring in researchers and their grant funding. These systems are typically less expensive than most other preclinical modalities, such as ECHO, PET, SPECT, MicroCT, and definitely MRI, but are complementary and compatible to co-registration with many of them. On their own, animal research facilities have some advantages for system placement over individual lab space, as well as over core facilities outside of an animal housing area. Animal facilities can employ specific housing schemes, offer SPF or BSL levels and movement paths, quarantine space as well. Most animal facilities have dedicated procedural space that can be associated with dedicated imaging space, making data collection more efficient. Animal facilities may benefit from stable per diems and smaller yet more steady space needs, instead of large initial space demands that diminish over time, leaving some space temporarily unused. If space allows, multiple modalities may be in the house, making crossover use more efficient. And of course, Animal research facility staff will have eyes on the colony, able to assist with delicate health statuses, anesthesia issues, and procedure recovery. Techs may also have the opportunities to train and specialize in handling and procedures for optical imaging, adding variety and new capabilities to their skill set. 
Core facilities are less focused on the animal care aspect and more on data generation. In my experience, they may be both outside of an animal facility, as with UF's MBI, or within, as found at UF's CGRC. Cores typically have a dedicated staff well-versed in the modalities that they cover, and this can allow cores to have in-house training on system operation, analysis, and applications. They may also offer grant application support, IACUC animal care and use protocol content, and animal handling assistance. Core facilities may also have multiple modalities, which makes co-registration data gathering easier and separate analysis stations or software suites that are costly but not broadly available. So why would either an animal research facility or core invest in preclinical optical imaging? It is indeed a capital equipment investment, typically over $100,000, but a single multi-user system is less costly and often easier to attain than an expanded or new facility, and typically less expensive than the other modalities I've mentioned. Access to these systems is frequently needed for the recruitment of PIs, and may be a tempting draw for other researchers and technicians who would like to learn the systems. As these systems lessen the fluctuations of animal numbers, per diems and hourly fees may remain steadier. As the cohorts remain over time, less labor is needed for import-export, allowing attention to other details. Fewer import events can also mean fewer chances of outside contaminants. There's a fee collection typically employed that may cover a variety of other expenses. Depending on the facility setup, various fee structures for assisted or unassisted use can be employed, helping offset both indirect and direct costs, such as salaries, consumables, service contracts, maintenance, or repairs. So let's talk about facility integration and how easily these systems are installed and maintained within a facility. System weight and height are not unusual and fit into pretty standard rooms. There's no special floor support needed or wall construction, so no major utility mods. Uh, typically standard house current is just fine. An individual circuit would be helpful, but not necessary. And you need three to four single outlets for the system, monitor, scavenging, uh, and the PC. Oxygen will be needed, and that can be delivered by tank, by an in-house system, or an oxygen concentrator, but that's required for the anesthesia setup. And facility conditions within standard research spaces all work to the system's advantage. 10 to 15 air changes helps keep the air clean and the camera cooling well. Room temperatures of 65 to 75 are quite comfortable for the machine, and 40 to 60% humidity allow the systems to operate normally. These systems often come in a couple sizes, smaller tabletop systems and floor standing units. To paint a better picture of the average setup, I'll run over each. So we saw these standard needs in the previous slide, nothing unusual there. The tabletop models, at least for spectral instruments imaging, look something like this. They're about 250 pounds, 22 inches wide, 26 inches deep, 48 inches high. So they will fit on either three, four or larger foot tables. Now, you're gonna want a standard but sturdy lab table. Uh, here in this illustration, we've got one that's 48 inches wide by 30 inches deep. It has sufficient space for the system, PC, and anesthesia. Of course, a five-foot table would be even better. There's no particular vibration dampening or specialized table surface needed, although having a lower shelf is always helpful. And the door opens upward, so you're not limited to certain room corners. With the floor standing systems, we have the same standard needs. But of course, there's going to be a big difference in height as these systems are nearly seven feet tall. They would come in at about 550 pounds, but the footprint is actually exactly the same. They come on five casters, which make movement easy. The PC is housed internally, which frees up some bench space. And all in all, these systems will fit easily, even into tight spaces. In this illustration, it's another four foot table. Uh, and the width needed for the four foot table in the unit is only six feet, two inches. Let's chat a little bit about what can seem like the 800 pound gorilla in the room, IACUC animal care and use protocols. These systems are actually pretty easily adapted to current or new ACUPs. And sidebar, if additional assistance beyond what's available on site or via ALAS is needed, we at SI Imaging can also assist. So the rationale, significance and methods are pretty straightforward. Rationales comply with the three R's, where we see a reduction in overall numbers of use through reuse, refined non-invasive method of data collection, Replacement tech can also be imaged. Uh, you might think of organs on a chip, organoids, or in vitro assays, which also ties in nicely with the recently passed FDA Modernization Act 
which promotes the acceleration of alternatives to animal testing in non-clinical research. The significance of this methodology is illustrated by over 4,000 in vivo imaging papers published during 2018 to 2023. The methods are standard in animal handling and care. Handling, transport, anesthesia, injections all fall well within well-defined guidelines. Systems use standard animal space decon solutions, such as 70% ethanol, MB10, etc. And integrated heating and anesthesia meet vet standards of care, keeping animal models warm and in a steady, controlled anesthetic plane. Last but not least is the ease of system operation. These systems have a gentle learning curve. SI imaging system mechanical and software functions are simple. They typically only require about an hour or two of training to get folks up and running on basic acquisition and analysis. The software is intuitive, offering easy click acquisitions for new users or more manual control for seasoned imaging veterans. Likewise, animal care and handling techniques are pretty routine from anesthetic induction and recovery to injections such as IP, sub-Q, and tail vein injections being the most common. Entry-level technicians can be rapidly brought up to speed on the workflow to image small animals. And that's it. Hopefully I've illustrated the utility of incorporating preclinical optical imaging into an animal facility or core near you. If you have any questions after this event is over, are interested in more info, or would just like to chat on apps or potential setups, please do reach out to either SI Imaging or myself. Our website is spectralinvivo.com, and here is my contact info. Thank you for viewing, and to ALAS for supporting this event. <laughs>